everybody. We're going to get started in just a few seconds. We're just waiting while everyone joins the platform. And Chad is doing like me, getting the last gulp of coffee in before uh, <laughs> before we all go here. <laughs> so, good morning, everybody. We're having a little bit of a technical glitch on our end. We haven't been able to get John Risley on yet, but we have Chad and Steve here. I just want to say thanks to everybody for joining us again this week for the Ocean of Opportunities webinar. What you're looking at in my window there is a view of Halifax Harbor from Cove Ocean, a gorgeous view on a, on a beautiful day. This is our fourth webinar in the series and the amount of people who are joining these webinars from the region and around the world is really exciting. Now is truly the right time to start an ocean company in Atlantic Canada. I think the video I'm going to play illustrates this point much better than I can, so I'll turn it over to the video. So oh, I think we're having one more technical glitch there. So I'll just continue on here. So today I'm, I'm so excited about our conversation with these three entrepreneurs, hopefully three entrepreneurs. Uh, what you're going to hear is that Atlantic Canada is the best place to start and grow an ocean company. Before we get to the, the speakers today, next week we will be joined by Craig Haney. Craig is a brilliant business mind, and he is going to discuss corporate innovation and how startups should best approach and collaborate with established companies. Be sure to look for the link to register for next week's webinar towards the end of today's talk. A few important notes as we get started. Our lab to market oceans applications are now open. Rebecca will put a link in the chat room, apply now. As well, our challenge competition is going to launch in May. Start developing that idea now because we want you to apply. We also want to create new connections and collisions through this webinar series. And so we've set up a Facebook group that all webinar participants are welcome to join so we can continue to interact and have those collisions. If you have an idea and need support, a co-founder, skills, or you can mentor or advise a startup, we encourage you to join the group so that you can meet people who may be able to assist. Search Ocean Startup Project on Facebook or click the link that Rebecca has posted in the chat room. We'll be hosting a virtual networking event over the next few weeks, which we will invite you to. The format for today's webinar will include our conversation with our special guests, hopefully John, Chad, and Steve. What we are showcasing is successful Atlantic Canadian companies and entrepreneurs at three different stages in their growth. While we are chatting, please be sure to introduce yourselves in the chat room and explain who you are and what you do. And please also post your questions. And we'll be sure to include them during the Q&A portion near the end of the webinar. So I'm thrilled to be joined by Steve and Chad and hopefully John in a couple of minutes. I think John is there. We're just waiting for his camera to come on. So as we get started, I'm just gonna turn it over to Chad and Steve right now to introduce themselves and their company and, and give us a bit of a bio. Uh, so Chad, over to you. Hey folks, uh, so I'm Chad Collett with Subsea Imaging. Uh, we were started in 2010. We're a bit of a mature company now, I guess, uh, 10 years. I guess not mature in human years. Um, yeah, um, I should, I'm in now. Okay, perfect, sorry about that. And, uh, so we, we focused on research and development of underwater imaging uh, products in the beginning, video processing systems, cameras, LEDs, and lasers. Um, we're located in Newfoundland, Canada, uh, rural Newfoundland, Canada. So we're a couple hours outside of St. John's um, where, you know, we've got cross country uh, skiing, downhill skiing, 20 minutes from a house, lots of outdoor activities, skidooing, ATV, that kind of stuff. Um, so we'll get into a bit of why we, why we, uh, settled here later on. Uh, and we now have over 130 clients worldwide and, uh, have equipment in every ocean. Do you want to talk a little bit about Rudder and yourself? 
Yeah, and before I start, uh, Don at the beginning was talking about his beautiful view of uh, looking at the harbor there this morning on his video. Looks like my cat joined me, one of the joys of working from home, so uh, he may look to be fading a bit, so I'll apologize if he gets a little vocal. Um, so uh, Rudder has been around a, a little longer than uh, Chad and the guys there at uh, Subsea, so we've been around for a little over 20 years. Uh, over the years, we've done everything from military manufacturing to marine safety lights, uh, VDR systems. Uh, the focus on the business now and has been for quite a while is around marine radar processing systems. So we connect to the standard navigational radar that sits on a on a vessel, sits on a rig, or sits in a uh, in a port, and uses that to analyze that signal that was from that old radar sensor to do other kinds of applications. We started off with uh, analyzing ice, which we used for the Canadian offshore, uh, and you know, analyzing pack ice and finding icebergs at longer distance, but also into uh, oil spill detection, uh, measuring waves and currents, and surveillance systems for security. Uh, and our newest applications just coming into market now doing real-time surface mapping of the ocean to give warnings of large waves in an area that may impact your operation, but also wave prediction systems that'll let you know what's going to happen in the future as well to integrate into things like uh, motion compensated cranes. Or I think, we just, uh, I think John just uh, disappeared there for a minute. And, uh, and so as we, as we get going, John, do you want to do you want to give just a, a quick overview of yourself? Uh, I think everybody knows you. I think they, uh, if they don't know you, uh, I, I would be highly surprised. But just a, a quick overview of your entrepreneurial background as it relates to the ocean. Um, sure. Well, I'm I'm very pleased to meet everybody, and and uh, uh, I didn't know Chad or Steve before. Um, or really a lot about their businesses. Uh, so I'm um, pleased to hear about you guys. And you know, obviously you guys actually have a real job. I'm not sure I have a real job anymore. Uh, so I'm uh, really uh, sort of an investor in a variety of businesses from financial services to biotech to uh, space. Um, we just bought a company called MDA, Canada's iconic space company. And uh, so I, I learn a lot uh, from very smart people like Chad and Steve and and uh, um, and uh, enjoy that uh, process. Uh, very focused on trying to grow uh, Canada's ocean economy. We, it's what we, we got our start, if you like, in the, in the ocean economy and the seafood business. We have a number of investments in, in early startup businesses and more mature businesses in the ocean economy. and. Uh, really see it as an area of tremendous opportunity for, for Canada and particularly this region. Terrific, terrific. And John is also the chair of the board of the Ocean Supercluster uh, and obviously very, very active in that ocean sector. So let's just jump right into it. And and I'm going to direct this towards Chad and John uh, out of the gate. But Chad, you're a relatively new business. and And I'm wondering if you could just tell us you know, how did you come up with the idea for for Subsea, uh, and and what your goal was when you started this company? Uh, yeah, okay. So, I had several years experience in the marine industry. By the time I got the idea for what we started doing, um, so at the time I was working offshore for another company using underwater cameras worldwide. Uh, so cameras being uh, you know, optical cameras for taking videos and digital stills underwater. Um, I thought I could make one better myself. So I started working on that, uh, started learning from mistakes early on and, uh, and eventually came up with a product and got it in the hands of some friends who also worked offshore in other companies and they did testing. Um, so that's, that's how we kind of got our first product. Um, so then what was our, what was our goal when we started? It was another question you said there, Don, right? Yeah. What was your goal when you set out? Uh, to make really technically advanced underwater optical systems. So very specific 
you know, that's, that's a very like niche specific thing. Um, so we, we set out to do one thing and do it really well. And we did that for quite a while. And then, uh, then later on we started kind of, that started to evolve and we started making more products. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Thanks, Chad. John, can you cast your mind back to when you started Clearwater? Uh, I think that was in the, the 70s. Can you cast your mind back to when you started, how you came up with that idea? And at that time, did you envision it growing into this global company uh, that, that it has turned into uh, now? Yeah, no. Um, uh, it was all about trying to make some money and not wanting to go to work for uh, anyone, uh, not that anybody would have ever considered hiring me. Uh, I can't imagine that. Uh, and uh, so we went through a long education process, if you like, trying to understand the business and where we thought the opportunities were. And um, uh, like Chad and I suspect Steve, uh, sort of morphed into um, a, a point where we realized that uh, we weren't different than anyone else. There wasn't a lot, a lot of opportunity to make money. And we always thought technology is our friend. Uh, so we were early investors in technology in a, in a segment of the ocean economy that everybody uh, saw as, uh, as, as not being technology friendly because technology involved cost and investment. And that's not the way you make money in the traditional seafood business. You make money by uh, not spending it. And uh, we, we went in the other direction. We were always investors in technology and we are today uh, we we always look for a technology lead if you like in the businesses in which we invest john can you just talk a little bit about how long did it take you to see a return on that investment in in technology in, in for clearwater yeah um look i mean there are all there's technology up and down the scale there are things you can do that have an immediate payback but but the more compelling, if you like, uh, uh, business proposition is always resident in in uh, coming up with a game changer, if you like, for you and, and your industry. And uh, the problem is there's more risk in those exercises. It takes more money and it, and it especially takes more time. And it always takes more money than you think. And it always takes more time. But you should be undeterred uh, because those barriers to entry are what give you a secure customer base at, at better than industry margins. Chad, do you want to just comment on, on what John just said that uh, as it relates to your business? Yeah, so investing in technology mean and um, kind of focusing on that. Yeah, yeah. That's essentially exactly. what we did so as well, yeah. In terms of starting out and, and it taking, you know, big investment up front oh, and- yes. And, yeah, so I, I started out and I was, I was a vast sum of money in. I was the primary investor in the beginning uh, and I was a vast sum of money in before I'd actually made a cent myself uh, and I wasn't really paying attention to that and it ended up being, uh, you know, uh, some figures um, before I actually got paid myself. So I guess as advice to other startup uh, people looking to do a startup, yeah, go go for investment i guess uh, there's lots of funds available for that and there's lots of programs which we'll get into i'm sure um but yeah don't do what i did don't uh, <laughs> don't uh, don't put all of your own money into it and uh and and definitely keep track of how much you do put into it in the beginning well we'll talk more about that <laughs> uh one theme uh this is our fourth webinar and and one theme that we've heard throughout this webinar series with Everybody we've talked to, when they're talking about starting and growing a company, they talk about team, team, team. Steve, I'm wondering if you could talk to us about your experience with Rudder and, and that team and, and the focus that you guys place on that. Well, <clears throat> you think about what uh, John and Chad are talking about, you know, kind of that long range investment, but it's a long range investment in the people as well. And one of the things for us besides, you know, and everyone always talks about, you know, make sure you have people that fit the culture and people to get along and those types of things. But one of the things for us, especially early on was people who could be cross-functional, you know, 
you know, a, a hardware guy who knows software well, someone who's good at logistics for scheduling, uh, scheduling uh, uh, technicians, but at the same time was really good on the phones for chasing people who owed you money, right? So across, across the board, having very, very flexible people who'd buy into that team as a small company to make sure that we were covering off all of our bases and keeping everyone busy at all the time, because if you're not if if you're not uh, being efficient, it's it's a, a really hard pill to swallow when you're small. Chad, you started out. You you talked a little bit about starting out and putting your own money in. Can you talk to us about the importance of team? You're now at 18 people, I think, that you've got employed there. Can you talk to us about that team at the beginning and and what that meant to you? Yeah. So. When you think about growing a company, when I think about growing a company, I naturally think about, you know, the people that were brought on. So the, the company is the people, obviously, um, and they have a, a lasting impact on not only the business, but on our customers. Uh, so it's all about, you know, the team starts to grow to include uh, agents and other people as well. So um, the priority placed on it, it's all about. It's all about the people in the group and all about the people that you're talking to every day. Um, so finding the right people can be a challenge as well, like Steve mentioned. Uh, it's difficult to find people who are not only multi-skilled in a small, I'll have Steve back here. Uh, multi-skilled in a small organization, but also people who uh, fit the culture. Um, so when, uh, when you do find them, you need to keep them. You need to reward them accordingly uh, because good people, good people are, uh, in a startup organization, good people are hard to find. Yeah. John, can you talk a little bit about team and, and you you talked about being an investor and, and when you're looking at investing in or acquiring a business, what, what role does the team play when you're, when you're looking at that company? Um, the most important, uh, part. Um, so, you know, the question is, uh, you should ask yourself what's more important is the business plan more important than the people or the people more important than the business plan and i think certainly in the context of my experience the people are always more important than the plan uh, you can't execute in the plan execute against the plan the plans worthless if you like and and good people can always figure out how to change the plan to make sure it's successful and in any startup uh situation and really even any short uh, situation, um, you'll find that the change is a constant, constant problem. Uh, and and it, it, you, you've got to have the right team of people, if you like, that, that can identify, if you like, what's happening in your industry, how you get ahead of it, how you become the leader, if you like, in, in that change. So people are in, incredibly important. So it brings me to another point. So we are talking about Atlantic Canada and making Atlantic Canada the best place to grow and, and start a, an ocean company. So let's talk about that, uh, attracting talent. So how do you attract talent? How do you attract the right people to your companies in these locations? And Chad, I'm gonna start with you because you're, you're really an interesting case here because you're in Clarenville, Newfoundland. So can you talk about attracting talent to Clarenville, Newfoundland and how you do it and how you keep those people. So these days with the way the world is right now, um, it doesn't matter where you live anymore. Uh, so we just posted, for example, a marketing job, you know, if you're qualified, apply. Um, and there's about 80 applicants, but they're all over Canada and the world really. Right. And we're not, we're not fussy anymore about location where someone actually lives. And we never were a lot, but it, it kind of had to come down between Clarenville or St. John's because we had two offices. Um, so Clarenville being a place to work, yeah, it, it, it allows people to uh, uh, kind of be flexible. It's a really rural environment, but there's a lot of, uh, you still need for a tech startup, you still need uh, some amenities, you know, grocery stores and all that kind of stuff has to be available close. So uh, the way it is with Clarenville, it's more of a hub. It's not pure rural, but I'd call um, what people in Newfoundland call around the bay. Um, you know, you're not in a town with 300 people. It's, it's several thousand and all the amenities are here. 
So um, it's only the distance to, distance to the airport. So that is an issue. And that doesn't matter right now either. <laughs> Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you. Same question. You guys are a, a company of about 35 people. You've got two different offices, one in Europe, one in, in St. John's, Newfoundland. Can you talk to us about searching for that talent and finding the right people and, and how possible that is in Atlantic Canada to find those people? It's funny because it's like most companies that are that are sitting in this region. Everyone talks about you know difficulty attracting talent, and there's you know there's a lot of competition, particularly in St. John's around tech resources. Uh, for us, we we found that one element that we are offering, which is something that Chad has with his business as well, and 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 as well as John, is that working with the ocean is very different. And, uh, you know, that makes it challenging. You know, I have, you know, people with PhDs in oceanography. I have you know, someone who's a specialist in, in uh, image processing and those types of things. They're very hard resources to find. But at the same time, for, for those people, it's very hard to find challenging and rewarding work. And so one of the things that we've done as a company is we always have long-term research programs going that will feed into, uh, I'll say the the D on the R and D for execution. Uh, for instance, I, I mentioned uh, early on about uh, a, a weight prediction system that we have that's coming out shortly. We've been almost ten years in research into this in the background, and that's very rewarding work for the researchers that are working on it. And then from the back end, very new technology, very interesting for the development team. But on the ocean side of it, there's also that leads to a lot of opportunity for our staff as well. You know, for instance, uh, one of our software developers spent three weeks on board a Canadian icebreaker in the Arctic, which most guys coming in for a software dev job wouldn't have that opportunity. So you kind of take advantage of some of our challenges in terms of testing, which means things that are very remote for certain types of people. That's a huge bonus. So we kind of leverage that. Thanks, Steve. John, can you talk about your experience with talent here in Atlantic Canada and, and people who, you know, we have here that can come and work at each of your different companies? Sure. You, you should not, uh, nobody should look at this as a barrier. Uh, some people uh, want to live in downtown Toronto and, well, that may be a mystery to uh, some of us as to why anybody wants to do that. Uh, I, I get it, and um, but on the other hand, uh, look, uh, there is, in my experience, most people will go where they think there is a great opportunity, provided uh, you think that that uh, the point that Steve just made, um, in an indirect way, uh, smart people want to take on challenges. They want to find opportunities to grow. They want to learn, and if you've got, uh, if you can offer that. Uh, then you will attract good people, uh, and I wouldn't worry about it. Um, but you've got to give, you've got to you've got to be willing to offer that. You've got to you've got to give authority. Uh, you've got to give responsibility. You've got to give lots of opportunity to grow and learn. Uh, and if th that is part of the criteria, if you like, that you're offering, you'll find good people. Uh, so, one question that I do have. You know, I hear talent is not a problem, but can you guys talk about why you would start an ocean business in Atlantic Canada? Chad, I'm going to start with you. Why would you? Why why start one in in Atlantic Canada? Uh, so there are a lot of programs available for one uh, through government assistance, uh, and they're mostly tailored around. Um, research and development. So if you're starting a technology company in Atlantic Canada around ocean, I, I can't think of many other places in the world that would be more ideal. Um, I haven't heard of other countries releasing programs like the uh, Supercluster. Uh, there's a lot of programs around ACOA, TCII in Newfoundland here. We have, there's provincial programs in each province. There's also federal programs. So, and they, they tend to work together. Um, and it's, uh, they also, another big point of it is, uh, they go in together on ocean tech pavilions at trade shows, which is extremely, 
useful. We've done our best business on the road at trade shows in the pavilions that Atlantic Canada has set up. Um, and there's also incubation centers like Cove and Genesis Center. And uh, there's, there's ones based out of every major university. Uh, and it's fantastic. It's really fantastic. So Steve, we're hearing from Chad that there's great supports for sort of a, a smaller business. Can you talk about the supports that are in existence for a, a business that, that's rudder size? Well, I mean, uh, Chad touched on it in terms of kind of the government support side. Uh, he covered off most of them. You know, there's, there's, there's lots of help from the Canadian government in terms of business development and, ex and export related uh, items. But one of the biggest things that you can take advantage of bringing an ocean ocean based startup into Atlantic Canada is just the location and in particular anything to do with Arctic. You look at the history of uh, rudder. We started off with ice radars. The cost that it would take us as a startup to do the ice based research that we needed to do for that product anywhere else in the world would be on board of an ice boat. here. For the prelim for the first part of the research we could pull a trailer up to the coast and get iceberg data which you wouldn't get anywhere else so it, it's it's important to remember here that you got you kind of got a, a nice combination you have those arctic conditions you have a lot of built-in customers in the area and because of things centered around uh the atlantic accord and and for those who are not from canada who may be on the on the call uh, you know, there's an investment level that comes back into into Newfoundland in particular from the uh, from the offshore industry for everything that's produced. And but because of that, they're very willing research partners as well. And, you know, we've done programs with the oil industry here that helps fund some of our research. But more importantly, we've developed really good relationships where you know, I have one one technician uh, one, sorry, one of our uh, our uh, R and D staff in particular, he could show up uh, down in the harbor at one particular vessel, and they do data collection for us on an ongoing basis. So there's lots of opportunity and a lot of collaboration that happens within within the region that helps you get past those research hurdles, which would be very expensive in other jurisdictions. John, do you want to talk a little bit about why why Atlantic Canada? Why is this a place to come? We've got lots of people internationally listening in on this webinar, but we also have lots of people who are here in Atlantic Canada who are thinking about starting a business. Why Atlantic Canada? So if you think about uh, uh, what's happened, if you like, uh, with the Valley, Silicon Valley, or Austin, Texas, or Boston, uh, the biotech hub, um, uh, those are places that are centers of innovation, uh, where there's lots of capital availability, where there's lots of professional mentoring, where there's customer bases, if you like, where there's generally a network, if you like, that supports traditional tech in the in the context of the Valley, traditional tech in the context of Austin, and biotech in the context of Austin. So that's what exists here in Atlantic Canada. We, we have got the basis, if you like, or nucleus of an ocean uh, network where there is, uh, as Chad has said, uh, capital availability, and not just from government programs and sources, but from, from the private sector. Uh, you don't go to Toronto to look to invest in an ocean tech startup. Uh, you come to Atlanta, Canada, or you go to Norway, um, um, and um, but and and again, what Steve said is obvious. That you know, this is where the customers are. This is where the ocean is, um, and and this is where you can, um, if you like, befriend and and talk to uh, other organizations that are attempting to build businesses in your sector, and that is very synergistic it's very educational it's very sort of supportive it's what makes these clusters work so well together and why we're so anxious to grow this cluster here because the more the, the stronger the cluster the the more success that it will generate for those people who come to uh, begin businesses here yeah it's such a it's such a wonderful time to to take a leap into entrepreneurship here i'm just going to switch gears a little bit here because you know, we talked about the there being business here, but all of you have sold your products globally. So 
Chad, I want to talk to you a little bit because SubC is a relatively new company. You're selling product into, I think, 20 countries around the world. Can you talk to us about, you know, as a startup, how you got those first customers? Uh, because as a startup, when you when when a customer's looking at you, they're probably taking a bit of a leap on you. So can you talk about how you you got that first customer and then how did you expand that globally? Yeah, that's a that's a good one. So it's actually over 30 countries now. Um, so we've we've made some good uh, strides since those stats. Um, so how we started uh, and got international business was we made a product. Uh, we sent that product to customers offshore who recorded some footage for us. Uh, and we put that footage on YouTube on the go then. Yes, it was. We put it on YouTube and uh, we made a website and we got some customers in Australia, just kind of uh, with a bit of SEO and Google magic. We, uh, we came up in some search engines and also through some contacts we had. So those first projects in Australia were pivotal uh, as from a revenue perspective, that was year one. Um, then how we expanded out from there, it's all about your contacts. It's all, all about people again. Um, so you need, you need agency uh, in this industry in ocean tech. You need you need people in because it's a it's a very it's a very wide but specific. It's worldwide, but it's very specific. So, like, if you talk to someone in Germany, uh, they probably know your customer in the west coast of the United States. Like, they it's a small network worldwide, uh, and there's people in specific areas that know those people. So getting agents is super important. So that's how we expand it, essentially. So Steve, can you you guys have a, a large global presence as well? You've got that office in Europe. How do you find your customers, and then how do you how do you service them uh, globally as well? Yeah. So our our model similar to what Subsea uses. We have a, a an international dealer network. You know, as a company of thirty five people just travel alone we'd never be able to, to service that kind of that kind of area so we we try to center into into trade shows where a lot of our dealers are in and uh and attending that way we can get together with as many as possible kind of best bang for the buck and then targeted meetings depending on the opportunity that could be in any particular region uh on the support side it's uh it it, it was very tough uh, uh at one point uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, 13, 1400 of these radar systems out there uh, in the market, you know, spanning up to almost 50 countries. And, uh, you know, we have we have two technicians on staff. Uh, but what we've done as part of that business model, we want to make sure that our dealer network is engaged. And, you know, there's other than that, you know, while well, they sold us sold some system for us, they've made their their cut and made a bit of money. We want to make sure they had an ongoing business. So from our side, uh, we've started training our dealers for the uh, for the for the ongoing support and technicians. So for them, they have an ongoing business where they go in and they and they service the equipment in whichever whichever country. You know, we have technicians in Russia, in Korea, in China, Brazil, Indonesia, you, you name it. And but that's part of their business where they make ongoing money with their relationship with rudder. And then, which of course is an, it's something to push them more towards getting more of our equipment new and in, which drives our business as well. So during, during all of this with, uh, with COVID-19, one of the things that, that has been good from the way we're set up is that, you know, our customers are still out to sea, they're still operating, but we can still service them. You know, there's obviously some limitations, but you know, we had a, we had a system that was installed uh, two weeks ago in China by one of our local uh, Chinese technicians. Unfortunately, he had to do two weeks of quarantine to get into the shipyard and two weeks of quarantine to get out. <laughs> but it allows us to keep going. We're still we're we're still moving business. Got to do what you got to do in this this era, at this moment. John, you were probably one of the pioneers from Atlantic Canada of. of international opportunities. Do you want to add anything to that? Do you want to talk about all of the international opportunities and how you get customers and service those customers? So 
securing uh, customers and keeping them and growing them is uh, really a generic uh, sort of lesson, if you like. Uh, what works in one industry works, in, in my opinion, in all industries. Uh, and we've learned that, that it doesn't matter what the business, it's, it's your responsibility if you want to, uh, good customers. And, and by the way, there are bad customers too. So it's important you select your customers. Um, and make sure they understand your commitment is to help them grow their businesses and make money. Um, and, um, and then you've got to live up to uh, that commitment. And, uh, and I would make it clear up front, as we always did, that look, if we have to get in the door with price, we'll get in the door with price. But that's not, that can't be at the basis of our relationship. We can't invest in this industry. We can't help you become better than your competition if we don't have the capacity to invest in our business. And our commitment will be to, will be to invest, will be to help you differentiate yourself in, the, in your marketplace so you grow, you're more profitable as a consequence of the relationship that we offer you. That's That has got to be at the heart of any relationship. And borders don't matter. Um, what, what works in Europe works in, in China, works in Japan, works all over the world. Uh, it may take longer. Culture is different in each jurisdiction. The nature of the relationship will be different. But it's always about turning a transaction-oriented kind of opportunity, if you like, into a relationship-oriented uh, business. And it sounds to me like Steve and Chad have both figured that out. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is the Ocean Startup Project, so I just want to I want to talk a little bit about startups and how your respective companies interact with startups. So, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you. How does how does Rudder work with startups uh, in the in the ocean sector now, and and what kind of advice would you have for a startup who's approaching a Rudder uh, to to do business with? Yeah, so. From, from Rudder's perspective, we're always on the lookout for new technology and, you know, and especially things that would be complementary to what we're working with, you know, within what, what we've built, we didn't build everything in there ourselves, you know, just as examples. And these, these didn't come from startups, but, you know, uh, a tracking system that we used was actually a piece of research that uh, Defense Research Canada was doing, DRDC, which we've licensed and commercialized and put into our surveillance products. We have uh, algorithms that we've licensed from the National Oceanographic Center in the UK, which have integrated in. So, you know, first first piece of advice, other than you know, find a find a market where your niche and you're unique and that you can you can compete into, uh, is if there's parts there that you can bolt on without having to redevelop the the, the wheel, go do that. I mean, and for the most part it's not as expensive as some people think going in there's you can always work out a mutually beneficial licensing agreement so that you can get yourself over that hump without having the large expense to get something that's readily available in the market uh you know from from us in that engagement with startups uh you know we our ownership group is always open to you know, acquiring other companies that may be of interest to it, for instance, Ocean Waves, which we bought in Germany about uh, seven or eight years ago. But we're always looking for people with IP that we could license and bring into our product. John, uh, I'm going to come to you on this. I know for a fact that you have startups knocking on your door because I have knocked on your door and you have kindly given me some time and advice uh, over the years. Can you uh, provide some advice to startups who are approaching established companies like a Clearwater or a Horizon or uh, uh, any other uh, established company out there. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, um, don't be intimidated. Uh, I never sensed you were, by the way. Uh, and uh, you know, you, you you need to understand that uh, um, that. Small companies bring a huge advantage to the table. That's their sort of, um, they don't usually have a lot of, of, of uh, 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 to risk because by definition, they don't, they don't have a business. They're hoping to build a business. And uh, so uh, they're a great appetite for risk that larger companies don't have. Uh, and if I think through a lot of what we've done, if you like, in our seafood business, 
uh, it's all being done through SMEs in Atlantic Canada, whether it be our automated scallop shucking uh, uh, machines, which which uh, were all developed locally by small business and still built here in Atlantic Canada, um, or our uh, body imaging software that was all developed using Atlantic Canadian uh, small uh, company resources. So there's a there's a very synergistic uh, play, if you like, between what large companies need uh, in terms of innovation and what small companies can provide. Um, but small companies have to learn to listen. There's no good just sort of going in and saying, well, this is what I can do. This is what I, I can offer. Uh, that, that may be great, but it may not be what that particular audience is looking for. Uh, and so you, you need to find, okay, well, what, what can I do? Is there an opportunity for me here uh, to take a bit of a change in direction so as to appeal to this market opportunity, if you like, that may be before me. Love that. Uh, I, I think I sense what your number one piece of advice maybe to a startup would be is to, to listen. I'm going to ask Chad, who has is, is closest to having been a startup, what would be your number one uh, piece of advice for a startup? And then I'm going to come to Steve on that. Yeah, one second now. I did write that down. Yeah, so I've got actually I got two. Um, one that we did, one that we did, and one we didn't do. So, uh, piece of advice: uh, focus on a specific product or solution. So don't try to do everything. Um, you can't, especially as a startup. Do one thing well. Uh, the other was uh, think something we didn't do was seek investment from partners um, and experience people in the sector. Who can give you advice and and have come with great contacts? That's something we didn't do that we should have done. Uh, someone like John would have been fantastic if we were trying to get into the seafood market, for example, as a as a primary investor in the business. We didn't do that, and we figured it all out our own, uh, and we're still figuring it out. But we we think we've done it, but it took ten years. <laughs> So we could have been. Yeah, I just want to pick up on something you said there because it's it's certainly been something that I've experienced. But it's it's that notion of focus in those early days. It's so hard for a startup to actually focus in on one clear path because you you get caught up trying to do everything and and chase everything because you need that revenue. Talk to us a little about how you learned that and how you how, what you decided to focus in on. Yeah, so we we did go after like we we didn't say no to projects. We were we were yes yes men, I guess is what you could say. Um, how did we learn to focus? By making mistakes, for sure, absolutely. So you can have you can have customers who are asking for the moon and make promises. Uh, to them because the, the dollar amounts seem uh, very uh, attractive. But, and without doing the math, you can see yes, but if you really get good at say project management and, uh, and dig in a little bit to the numbers, um, they don't tend to lie. So don't say yes to everything, do your math, take your time, figure it out, talk to people with experience. Uh, find, if you don't know them, find them and don't give up until you do and uh and before you you jump in on a big project steve i'm coming back to you on the original question of advice to startups what what would be a piece of advice you would give to a, somebody starting out in the ocean sector well see so you left me last if after everyone gave great advice uh but uh, you go back to uh, john said from a couple questions ago which you know sometimes you fire a customer Sometimes you fire an opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've had that in our history where we've had a project and it, it's a dud. And your, your gut is to keep going because everyone wants to go to completion. And they're like, oh, no, it was valid when I started. But watch for those avenues in your business that are dead ends. And, you know, and we've, and in our history, we've held on to a few too long. Uh, that we should have cut ties on. But the other thing too is, you know, and we've talked a lot about, you know, funding that's available and, you know, and, and investor partners and, and everything else. At 
be proactive in how you're communicating with the people that are investing in your company and the, the you know the government side if you do have government investment you know one of the hardest conversations i thought i was going to have was to walk into a uh, a uh, room full of people who are investing in, in a project we had to tell them that it was it was a dud and that we didn't want to do the last trial that they're doing that was going to be a hundred thousand dollars coming to us as revenue but we we didn't think there was a commercial future for it at the end of the day people that were in that room came back and brought a lot more than that hundred thousand dollars back into our company because they seen us as a good risk because we did we were delivering on what we were doing when we realized that there was a there was no commercial end to it and everyone was wasting their money we didn't take the last few bucks and we came and we said hey look this is this is a waste of your money let's let's park it and be done with it and it actually has led into a lot of investment back into us and projects which have become great commercial successes for us i'd love to add something what steve said there actually um so there's two phrases that are common around that too so one fail early and fail cheap uh is a big one on projects and and uh things you're going to invest in and another one is the sunk cost fallacy that we all get kind of tied up in as humans. Um, so the more money you put into something the, or the more time, uh, the more valuable it seems in your head. Uh, but you need to, you need to be able to see outside of that and, and see when something is a, is really and ultimately going to fail. John, do you have anything you want to build on there that Chad or Steve said? Oh, great, great advice. Couldn't agree more. Perfect. Uh, I want to just come back to something, Steve, you referenced it, and, and John, you mentioned it earlier, and people in the chat room want to know, what makes a bad customer? John, I'm going to start with you because you raised it. Uh, several things. A, uh, somebody who um, says price isn't, isn't important and then completely focuses on price every single time. Uh, somebody that will um, trade you, um, if you like, over overprice. Uh, somebody you don't have uh, a good sort of chemistry connection to. Uh, you need to have a good relationship with the customer because a uh, it may well be that your decision is to only have one customer in a particular geographic market. So then your choice of customer is is very important to you. Uh, if you're going to help that customer beat their competition in the local market uh, or in that market niche. Uh, then you can't trade with everybody in that market. So you need to select the customer that's most likely to succeed, who most thinks like you. Is this somebody you enjoy going out to dinner with, if you like, and having a few drinks with? Uh, do you get along with, well with them socially? These are, these are all really important questions you have to ask yourself. Steve, yeah. that's on a bad customer. <laughs> I'll talk about from two angles, actually. So from from an in customer perspective you know john john hit it on the head but in addition you know you know any any customer that you have there is a, a draw on resources one that you're dealing with either is, is because of a draw on sales resources or it could be a draw on technical resources depending on what you're selling and the kind of service that you're delivering and there are the customers that chew up a lot of your people's time and not with what I'll call uh, valuable end results. You know, you know, if there's a technical problem you're working through, it's fine. But you do have some that find every small thing that'll chew into someone's time, and it's and there's a point where you look at it and say, okay, is this a problem with my product, or am I seeing something in this other organization? And they're they're costing me so much in the back end every time we sell. Uh, from the end customer, then also, you know, a, at the end of the day, our dealers are our customers as well. I mean, we're serv we're helping, they're servicing their end customer in business, but we're servicing their business as well. And, you know, John talks about, you know, it's, you know, about guys who he says it's not about price, but then it's about the price. And you see that with, with dealer partners as well, you need to be aware of because everyone's business ethics and everyone's approach to customers and to customer service isn't the same as yours. And keep in mind that when you're using a dealer network, you 
are being represented by that other company. And if you're not comfortable with them, and like John said, if you're not going to go to dinner with them and, and then they're probably not the right dealer for you because at the end of the day, they are your face to that customer many times, especially in a situation like we have where we a lot of that technical support goes through. So we keep a close eye on to feedback that we do here on our dealers and our network and especially the, the service installers because they are the, they are our face to that end customer. Okay, guys, uh, we're running out of time here. So one question I really do want to get in with all of you is, where do you see opportunities in the ocean sector right now? Where, what, what are things that you would recommend people look at and focus on? I'm going to start with you, you on that, John. Um, easy questions. Uh, everywhere. Uh, look, it, it's an emerging sector. Uh, it, there's opportunity in traditional businesses to save costs uh, through the use of technology. Uh, there's opportunity in businesses like uh, like Chad, which really opens a new frontier, brings the technology to the market that allows its users to do something they previously were not able to do, uh, which is sort of a green a greenfield kind of opportunity, if you like. Uh, and uh, so, uh, if you come along to a CDL session, or if you go to any of the incubators across Atlantic Canada. The number of, I mean, this is a huge learning exercise for me. I am hugely impressed, if you like, by the number of ideas that are coming forward um, to um, develop businesses around the ocean sector. So there's no shortage in any in any sector of the of the ocean economy. Love that, uh, Steve. Uh, see, kind of two areas. I mean, you know, we're very much into that sensor business. And, you know, the, a lot of history in oil and gas, a lot of history in defense, but it's taking parts of those businesses and applying them over to other industries. And you're seeing this with the super cluster, you know, and I'm sure John, part of the reason for your, your heavy involvement is looking at how you can take technologies in some of those sectors and apply them over in, in different ways. And, you know, you look at what we had done with our history and taking that radar sensor that all it did was let you know if you're, you know, if you're on a collision course, basically, and using that to provide other information and making that valuable within the industries. Uh, you know, there's a big push overall in the marine industry on data collection and, and analytics, and I think there's a, a lot of growth there. Where there's a lot of information being being collected at any given day offshore, and is to make that more valuable within within a uh, an operation but more importantly some of that information in one industry may be valuable to another as well and finding ways to perform analytics to find information that may be valuable within those other industries so you can you can leverage off infrastructure on information that they're willing to share dad over to you uh, so final the biggest word here. final word okay so a little pressure not really. All right. So market diversification would be where I would say uh, the biggest opportunity, at least for us in the ocean sector. Um, if managed correctly, uh, oceans are ultimately sustainable. So that's a major opportunity for growth and long term thinking. So you can you can develop products and services for, say, the aquaculture industry. People have to eat. Uh, it's a growing market. Uh, also for the fisheries, those, if managed correctly, are sustainable. Shellfish particularly, easy to manage properly, I think. Uh, well, nothing's easy. But, you know, if done right, those are sustainable markets that have a lot of opportunity for products and growth. So uh, that's echoing a bit of what John said as well. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for growth in the ocean. That is the perfect thing to end on. <laughs> Gentlemen, really, really appreciate it. I'm going to just do a brief presentation uh, on the Ocean Startup Project, but I love that we're ending on the fact that all three of you have cited that there is a ton of opportunity in the ocean sector. There's a ton of opportunity here in Atlantic Canada, and that's why we're doing this project. So, gentlemen, I'll come back to you in a couple of minutes just to say thank you, but uh, we're going to just launch into a, a quick presentation on uh, the Ocean Startup Project. So. 
Some of you have heard this before uh, over the last couple of weeks, but I, I just want to highlight what we're doing at the Ocean Startup Project. And, and the purpose of this project is to generate more startup companies in Atlantic Canada. With this project, we have an unprecedented regional collaboration between six pan-Atlantic organizations and the Ocean Supercluster. So along with the Ocean Supercluster, we have Innovacore, Genesis, New Brunswick Innovation Fund, Springboard Atlantic, PEI Bio Alliance, and CDL, Creative Destruction Lab. And what we're doing is we've got an aggressive 24-month project to grow and develop startups here in Atlantic Canada. So what's our vision? The vision of this is to make Atlantic Canada the best place in the world to launch and grow an ocean company. We know that that is a bold vision and we think that there really has never been a better time to be bold in the ocean sector. And you just heard that from John, Chad and Steve. This is the time and place to start an ocean company. So why Atlantic Canada? Well, uh, we've got incredible amount of resources. Uh, we've got $300 million being invested from the ocean supercluster. You just heard from our speakers today about all the government support with ACOA and ICED and IRAP. There are so many different organizations out there that are wanting to support you as a startup and as a medium-sized company in this province and we're ready and we're here to help you and we want to help you grow. So this project is going to invest about seven million dollars into startups. So here we have a slide with a, a lot of different logos on it. So in addition to all that this region is home to and, and we've got these internationally renowned ocean hubs like Cove and Holyrood in Newfoundland, Atlanta Canada also has so many incredible supports beyond the government available to help entrepreneurs, including organizations like the partners that I just mentioned. But we've got, we've got incubators and accelerators like Propel, Volta, Ignite, Planet Hatch, Startup Zone, PEI. Then we've got NL WIC, we've got the, the Grenfell campus in, in Warnerbrook. There, there's these are only a few of them that I'm mentioning, but there's just so many different, different supports uh, available to you. And we want to help you connect with those supports in this ecosystem. So essentially, the Ocean Startup Project will collaborate with all of these different organizations to make your idea become a success if possible. So I want to just highlight a couple of the exciting projects that we are launching. We've got the Ocean Startup Challenge. Now that is uh, a project that is uh, launching in May. We are really, really excited about this. Right now, what we're doing with this challenge is we've gone out to industry and we're getting feedback of the pain points they see in the ocean sector. So in May, we're gonna start asking startups to provide solutions to those industry challenges. And once we get once we launch this and get the applications, you're gonna be given eight to nine weeks to prepare and submit a response to that challenge. And then at the end of that, we're gonna select 10 companies to receive about $25,000 for a sprint. But even if you're not selected, we wanna work with you and we wanna help find you the supports that you're gonna to need to continue to grow your company and idea and develop uh, into one of these companies like we, we've seen today. So we think now is the right time to take that leap into ocean entrepreneurship. The other one that I wanna highlight is our Lab to Market program. The Lab to Market program has launched. We are looking for applications and we are really excited about this. This is about going out and finding those researchers, those grad students, those postdocs, those faculty members, of which we have a whole plethora of here in Atlantic Canada, and we want to help them get their research and their idea from the lab to the market. So finally, uh, what we want to do is stay in touch. Uh, here's some ways that we can stay in touch, and I just want to encourage you to go to some of these sites if you have any interest in uh, the ocean sector, we're here to support you. We want to help you. Ask us any questions. 
and, and we look forward to hearing from you. So folks, uh, just a very big thank you. Uh, and uh, we are a huge thank you to John and Steve and Chad. You know, these are, these are three stories of success at, at different stages along the path. You heard it today, there's just no doubt that Atlanta Canada is one of the best places on the planet to start and grow an ocean company. The companies you heard from today are all selling product around the world that is produced and manufactured in Atlantic Canada. We need more people to start and grow companies here and this in this region, and it's filled with the support required to do so. So now is the time, so let's get going. Before we leave, I want to say a thank you to Atlantic Livestream and for their in-kind support. As always, I want to thank Natasha and Rebecca who, who make this webinar series come together. So to, to sum up, please sign up for our next webinar on April 30th, which will take place at the same day, time as today's webinar. If you can't make the next webinar, but you want to stay connected, please join the Facebook group, check out our webpage or follow us on social media to stay up to date on the latest developments with the Ocean Startup Project. Apply to the lab to market and keep an eye out for that challenge over the next few weeks. The ocean sector is alive and well and Atlantic Canada is the place to take advantage of it. So a couple of great things that are, one great thing that is happening uh, that I wanna highlight for you right now is DeepSense at Dalhousie has a data readiness project that has been launched. A company can receive the benefit of a student to help them organize their data at no cost. Check out the link in the chat box uh, if you want more information. So finally, just a, another thank you to Chad, Steve, and John. Really, really appreciate your time and advice. Uh, folks, this has been a particularly heavy week for us in Atlantic Canada, and in particular, Nova Scotia. Having connection is more important than ever. So a big thank you for connecting with us today and sharing some of your time. It really means a lot. Thank you, folks, and take care of yourselves. Thank you. Thanks, guys.